Besides the, just the unprotected strikes that halted South Africa's commodity exports, the rand has been affected by a ballooning trade deficit that is now over 100 billion rand year to date. This is roughly 10 times worse than the same period last year. Joining us from Cape Town to tell us if the rand is living on borrowed time is JP Duplessis from Prescient Investment Management. Thanks so much for your time, JP. I certainly hope that the rand is not living on borrowed time. Let's get your thoughts at the top on that. Well, uh, it's pretty, that's a pretty dramatic statement. Uh, I'm not sure that the rand is, is going away as a, as a unit of currency, but certainly there's a lot of pressure on, uh, pressure on the rand. And we're seeing that build over time. Uh, the, trade, um, the trade deficit is, is one, um, one aspect of that. I think the most interesting thing about the most recent trade deficit number was that it wasn't because of the l lack of exports as a result of the mining, um, the mining strikes, but more around that capital imports and an increase in, in imports. And we're seeing that as a, as a, potential, um, a potential trend as we're seeing large investments by, by the um, state-owned entities. A lot of that investment, especially when it comes to capital goods, is being funded by offshore uh, bond issuance, dollar, dollar bond issuance. Uh, but the, the, the issue with that, of course, is that the, um, the, dollar, the dollar funding has to be paid and that's, that has to be done, um, uh, to the, the debt has to be serviced. So that puts additional strain on, on the currency when we're already seeing huge bond ownership locally by foreigners, and those uh, foreigners are repatriating those uh, coupons that they're receiving on the, the 84 billion rands worth of bonds that they've bought this year back into their home currencies, the dollar, the euro, etc. And that's putting additional strain uh, on the rand. JP, we talk about this, uh, the extent of um, companies that earn their earnings outside of South Africa. And if I think if you look at uh, the All Share Index, I've heard of figures as high as 76% of uh, all earnings for listed companies on the JSC are generated offshore. If that's a figure you agree with, surely that's a natural, uh, th that would naturally prop up uh, the RAND because these, these companies, as they repatriate the money, would have to be buying uh, RANDs almost indefinitely into the future. Well, Warren, I'm not sure I could uh, talk specifically about the, those numbers. I don't have them to hand. Uh, but the, the experience has been in the past that what's been done with offshore uh, earnings has been to reinvest them in offshore businesses, not rather than necessarily bring them into, into, uh, back into South Africa. Of course, the frustration in the past was that there, there was, they, couldn't, they couldn't use the, 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 the cash buildup that, that uh, they had in, in South Africa. But now that we are more open uh, and able to invest in offshore markets, they tend to use that, that money to, to invest in, in offshore markets. Having said that, you know, that, that's, that's been the case for the, the most recent period where the RAND has been expensive. If the RAND were to re weaken, and we still think the RAND is relatively expensive, but if the RAND were to re re weaken significantly, that could put a little bit of a cushion on, on the, the fall, of, fall of the RAND. Just over the December period, what are you expecting from the RAND, which has been tracking at this 880 level to the dollar? Do you think that we're in for a quiet time where the local unit is concerned? Yes, it's a very difficult question. I think forecasting, forecasting anything is incredibly difficult. And at present, we don't, uh, we don't uh, try and forecast. We look at where the risks versus reward are. And I think forecasting the RAND is probably the most difficult uh, thing to forecast. Um, it, it certainly looks, we, we, had a, we had a period where uh, we had all this industrial action um, and that, that, and round rating movements, etc. That put a lot of st uh, st strain on the RAND. It, more, it looks more likely with, with a sort of more positive environment um, in terms of uh, Europe, our bigger trading partner, that, you know, that's going to be a little bit supportive. Uh, we saw PMI today come out. Um, yes, still under the 50, but a little bit better than it was and a little bit better than people expected. So all in all, it doesn't look like we're going to see the next leg uh, down in terms of value of the RAND, uh, maybe in the, in, the next, uh, in the next foreseeable future. But we do think that over time, the pressure that's building up on the RAND will, uh, will come to the fore. Obviously, JP, one of the biggest factors for the RAND is uh, the yield, uh, the relative yield of the South African bond market against some of the larger peers uh, overseas. And what do you, I just wanted to get your perspective on what was happening in the bond market after the world, after inclusion in the 
World Government Bond Index. Uh, is there still strong demand for South Africa's uh, bonds? And is that something that we can bank on for the next few years? Is that uh, with low interest rates in Europe and America, uh, we're going to see foreigners picking up the bonds and that's ultimately going to sustain our, uh, our currency? Absolutely, Warren. What we have seen this year is incredibly strong demand for, for our bonds. As you say, it is driven by the interest rate differential, uh, our bonds versus uh, bonds in US Treasuries or uh, German Bunds, for example. So that, that has definitely uh, been driving our bond market. You're absolutely right. We're in a period where it looks like rates are going to be low uh, for a long period of time, and that is supportive of uh, bond markets in general but you'd have to say if you look at the US market or you look at the German market or the Swiss market or the Dutch market all of these markets are incredibly overbought uh, they're incredibly expensive and, and one could say they're a bubble of sorts it's very unclear um, how when that that bubble is going to going to burst and it probably would take uh, a period of sustained better growth in those economies and an end to this kind of deleveraging uh, process that we've, we've been on and it's hard to tell when that's going to finish but equally we'd say it's also very very difficult to buy something which is not good value and we at Prescient are staying away from um, are certainly staying away from uh, developed market bonds and we're treating, we're treating our own uh, bonds with a level of suspicion to the extent that they are priced relative to, uh, to US bonds. Clearly there's a premium for the country risk, you, you're investing in South African government issued bonds, there's a premium because you're investing in rand rather than in dollars. Um, but having said all of that, we tend to trade uh, in quite, if you look historically, uh, relative to, to those developed bond markets. Uh, and so we, we, we're a little bit cautious on bonds as an investment right now. Just one of the theories that, uh, that we've heard from some of the macro strategists uh, at some of the large investment banks is that this printing of money by uh, Ben Bernanke at the, at the Federal Reserve in the States has been to try and uh, compensate for the deleveraging that's been taking place by consumers on one hand in the States and also uh, from derivative markets uh, in America. I just wanted to get your perspective on, on what's your view on ultimately on deflation and inflation because there are some people that are saying that uh, uh, a lot of this money creation has been done to try and prevent deflation but on the other hand there's also people that are saying that this money creation is going to lead to massive inflation in the future. So I just wanted to get your perspective on, on uh, what the consequences were for money creation going forward. Yes, I mean, I think that's the, the, the trillion dollar question, really. Uh, you're absolutely right. What the Fed has done is expanded its balance sheet, uh, the quantitative easing process, because while it was expanding its balance sheet, the private sector, households, banks were reducing the size of their, of their balance sheets. And the, the transmission mechanism of monetary policy was stuck in that even zero interest rates weren't encouraging banks to lend because they'd over lent in the period uh, running up to the crisis. So that's where we are right now. If we're in a situation where the uh, banks start to really increase lending, and we have seen some sort of recovery in, uh, in, in US, we're not sort of at 06, 07 levels, uh, um, but we have seen a recovery in, in lending, then we could see a period of higher inflation. Certainly the market was very worried about deflation, and when you have this, uh, when you have this significant deleveraging uh, environment, then that, that is always a risk. It looks, uh, it looks like the, the, the Fed through its actions and, and the other central banks around the world have seen, seen off that risk. Uh, whether that becomes inflation in the longer run uh, really de depends on the Feds and other central banks around the world's willingness and ability to actually go and raise rates and, re and reverse the quantitative easing if we started to see a pickup in activity and in a pickup in inflation. And the risk that the market sees is that if uh, we start to see a pickup in inflation as a result of the quantitative easing, that central banks would rather err on the side of, well, we know how to deal with inflation, rather have a bit of growth, a bit of inflation, let that run for a while before we start to put the brakes on it. We saw that the, the Japan example, and we're not saying that the, the US is a, is a Japan, but we saw in that process that the, the central bank there put on the brakes too early on, on, their, on their quantitative easy process and killed the recovery. And I think that's where central banks will err. And as an investor, you could see inflation printing significantly higher for quite a long period of time before central banks 
react with increasing interest rates. JP, are you expecting any additional negative news flow out of the Eurozone, or do you think that that territory is going to, going to lay low for a while? Well, uh, you know, for, for me, it's a little bit of a, a, a slow uh, car crash. Um, what we've seen from the ECB um, and the Troika with Greece is that we've, we've pumped a lot of, they pumped a lot of liquidity and they've, they've, uh, they've sort of produced a bazooka in terms of liquidity, but it hasn't really solved the issue, which is more of a solvency uh, story. Uh, liquidity makes everybody feel better. It's the pill that makes you feel better, but it doesn't really uh, heal, the, heal the broken leg or heal the heal the, the solvency issue. And uh, you know that, I think, is still going to come to the fore. What they've done is they've very successfully kicked the can down, down the road. Um, and, uh, but nevertheless, the can is still going to be there um, in, in months to come. So it's not a story that's going away. At the end of the day, you have economies grouped together that don't, uh, that don't go at the same pace. You've got very, very many different paces of economy in, uh, in the Eurozone. You can imagine if South Africa joined the Eurozone, we talked about the RAND earlier, if South Africa joined the Eurozone, our productivity is not as, uh, not as high as, as Germany's. We have a, 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 a higher inflation rate over time. So to, to link us to Germany through a, a common currency, for example, would be very, very difficult and would definitely have an impact on our, on our fiscal, uh, fiscal state. And that's what, you, what, you, what you've got in Europe. You've got countries with very high un unemployment rates like Spain and Portugal, where they've been tethered to uh, uh, very efficient uh, economies like Germany. And, and you know, this, this rash of liquidity, this uh, bout of liquidity, isn't really solving that, that fundamental problem. JP, just to catch up on another story, and perhaps you can talk to us here through the, the Prussian Global Income Fund, uh, which is which is denominated in US dollars and has a pretty free mandate. We had uh, Meredith Whitney, uh, who runs her own consulting firm now, talking about uh, threats or problems in the US municipal bond market, which is one of the biggest fixed in income markets in the world. Uh, I just wanted to touch base and see... Have there been any other cities? We saw a couple of cities in, in, uh, the, in the likes of California going bust. Have there been any problems, uh, any waves in that market? And has that been a market that you've been investing in for this fund? Well, th let me ask, uh, answer your last question first. And that, that is not, we haven't been investing uh, in, in this fund in, in municipal debt. You know, municipal debt is a very large market, but it's, a, it's a somewhat of a... Uh, somewhat of a dinosaur of a market in, ter in terms of it tends to be very buy and hold. Its tax efficient st uh, status means that it tends to be bought very at the primary market when it's first issued and then you know put out in the mattress and not really traded in the secondary market. So you know the liquidity there doesn't really um, isn't that great. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think the worry, uh, the concern over the municipal market is. The, the, the strain that, uh, that the finances have been put on at a local level in the US. You know, we've talked a lot about austerity in Europe, etc. But the reality is there has, been, uh, there has been austerity in the US, but it's been done more on a local basis because the funds that municipalities were getting from uh, taxes uh, where they were expecting increases from housing developments, etc., that never, ever happened. Um, has, has really uh, put a major strain on, on, their, uh, on their finances. They've been helped out by, uh, by federal allocations, but nevertheless, that, that has, um, that has uh, put a strain on them. You know, I haven't, we haven't done, uh, as I say, we don't invest in that market, but we haven't done um, you know, a huge amount of research on, on that. But what I would say is that, uh, anecdotally, is that they, we started, they started to see uh, increase in hiring of more, you know, They've started from a very, very low base of hiring, but they're starting to hire uh, municipalities in general, are starting to hire those kind of key workers like teachers and firemen and, and policemen, et cetera. So I think it, as, a broad, uh, as a broad brush, the, the municipalities are looking better, but certainly there'll be pockets, isolated pockets of uh, uh, municipalities that just simply have not been able to cope with this, this strain on their, on their finances.